Aikido Journal podcast. This is your host, Josh Gold. Today, we'll be speaking with Philip Greenwood Sensei. Philip started Aikido in the mid 1970s at Pasadena Aikikai and currently holds the rank of sixth don in Aikido and fifth don in Aiki Toho Iai. In addition to his more than 40 years experience in Aikido, he's also studied Okinawan Kempo Karate and Judo. Philip teaches Aikido in the method of Shoji Nishio and is a student of Koji Yoshida Sensei, one of Nishio Sensei's appointed successors. He's also president of the Nishikaze Aikido Society of America, the official organization of Nishio Sensei's Aikido in the United States. He and his wife Heather teach at their custom built dojo, which is on their property in Temecula, California. He's also been a practicing chiropractor for 28 years. Welcome to the podcast, Philip. Thank you very much. I was hoping we could start with you giving a little bit of background on Nishio Sensei. Sure. Um, Nishio Sensei uh, started Aikido at Aikikai Hambu in 1951. And just to put that in a little perspective, it was the same year that the current Doshu was born. So in respect to training and also in age, he was actually a, a senpai to people like Tamura Sensei, Saseki Abe, Fujita, Yamada, Chiba Sensei. Uh, and I think he really admired uh, people there like Tada Sensei, Yamaguchi Sensei. And he's also friends with uh, Tomiki Sensei. At that time, he actually um, knew Tomiki Sensei from his earlier training when he was still at the Kodokan. Uh, but uh, earlier in uh, Nisho Sensei's life, when he was 15, it was uh, around 1942, it was right in the middle of World War II, he, uh, he moved to Tokyo as a young man and got a job working for the Ministry of Finance at the Japanese Mint. And it's at that time that he actually started judo at a dojo that was near where he worked. Um, and then after the war, uh, the Kodokan was getting uh, started again there. And uh, he actually tells about that time, like he went to the Kodokan to sign up. And it was 1945. He said all the windows were blasted out because of the you know wartime damage, and there was nobody there. There was just like some old, uh, like a janitor that was there. And he says he just wrote on a piece of paper his name so he could sign up. But in a few months, things kind of got yeah, things kind of got. It's it's really interesting. Uh, these early days, it was a, it was a little bleak. You know, I can only imagine what it was like. You know, having uh, the city bombed out, and you know, it's a very different time. And uh, so the the uh, the teacher that actually ended up training under was uh, Kyuzo Mifune, the you know, famous uh, one of the very few tenth dons, actually uh, at that time. Legendary, and legendary, le legendary, absolutely. So, uh, but in those early days, he says sometimes he'd go to the dojo there, and there'd be nobody there. So he'd just spend time practicing his ukemi, and then he'd go home. Um, but he stayed there, and he went up actually through fourth dawn at Kodokan under Mufune. Wow. Uh, yeah. There's an amazing but, video that's floating around on, on YouTube of Mufune Sensei doing, doing some freestyle practice with people that are far larger and younger than, than yes. him. Uh, so I recommend anybody that hasn't seen that, uh, check it out. Just, just you know, search, search on YouTube. It's a great, great little video. I know the video you're talking about is absolutely beautiful. He just takes one after the other. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really, really lovely to see. But interestingly, and, and it's kind of an interesting window in Nisho Sensei's mind, he says he kind of became dissatisfied with the limitations that competition was placing on judo. Uh, and today, it's sort of the reverse. Like today, you heard a lot of conversation about how we should introduce, you know, kind of testing and even competition into Aikido. But it's interesting to see that even at that time, under somebody like Mufune, that Nisho Sensei was thinking that maybe competition was placing some kind of limitation. And I, I wish that, you know, I could go back and kind of ask him more about what he was thinking that that time you know like after your teachers are gone you kind of like think of all these things you know as you're reminiscing on it that you should have asked them but you didn't 
But I'm curious to know exactly what was going through his head at that time, because he was still a young guy, like in his early 20s at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, So when he kind of got a little dissatisfied with the judo training, he went and he trained with uh, uh, Konishi. Also, Hiro Konishi was uh, the founder of what's called Shindo Jinenryu, a form of karate. And uh, he, interestingly, Konishi was also a student of Ueshiba. And um, there was a, a fellow that uh, was a teacher there, Sodayama. And uh, he came in one day and he was just uh, talking all about, so excited, talking about all about how he'd seen uh, Ueshiba and, uh, you know, that he had kind of interacted with him. And he said, this guy, I couldn't touch him. And so uh, he said, you got to go see this guy. And so... Uh, uh, Nisho uh, was curious about it, and so he went to uh, the uh, Aiki Kai, and and that was in 1951. Uh, it it wouldn't be for like another uh, like year and a half or so, he said, before he actually saw you know Osensei in person. It was just Kishamaru Ueshiba and Koichi Tohei that were teaching there, and um, Yamaguchi Sensei was there. And, uh, but even at that time, you know, like the early judo days, he says, he'd go and there'd no, be nobody there. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know, he'd go to the Aikikai and there's nobody there. He says like maybe four or five people there, you know, at most training at that time in 1950, 51. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but he says like about a year and a half later, uh, things were picking up and, uh, Osensei came to visit and he saw him and. And he saw something that was really different from what he had seen from the other teachers there at Aikikai because Osensei was constantly picking up the Ken, picking up the Joe, showing everything from the perspective of sword and staff. And um, when Osensei left, uh, he'd ask other teachers there, like, what what was that? Because it wasn't like anything they were doing at Aikikai. And he says you really couldn't find any good answers. Um, so he sort of took it in his own hands to go seeking out instruction from people who were, you know, very high level, ninth, tenth dawn people in sword and in Joe. And, and he sought these teachers out on his own. So he went and studied with uh, uh, Sano Sensei, who was uh, a tenth dawn in uh, Musajikida and Ishinru and sword and he started at that time i think formulating what would ultimately ultimately become uh what we have today which is aiki toho ei interesting uh, yeah um and then he also studied in uh, jo on, under uh, shimizu uh in uh, musoru jodo shindo musoru and um that was something interestingly see the the uh, martial arts in Tokyo at that time uh, a lot of that was getting promoted by uh, Jigoro Kano the founder of judo these uh, these Musoru uh, Jodo people were actually invited to Tokyo to teach there so a lot of these things were readily available where he was living you know within a stone's throw of uh, you know of the Tokyo area there um, and they also had some experience in uh, in spear. There's a lot of uh, there were spear teachers around Tokyo because in feudal times, like the Hozoinru uh, Yari, that was something that was actually centered around um, Edo, which was modern, you know, which is modern Tokyo. So there were still remnants of of, of you know of um, spear training uh, in the area there. So and then uh, so, but there's a lot more detail to these to these stories. But that's the kind of the gist of the evolution that he took um, uh, through his early training prior to prior to Aikido. But clearly, a well-rounded martial artist and somebody that, um, while Aikido was his main focus, he uh, he'd explored a number of other areas in the martial landscape in a great amount of depth. Yeah. Yeah, and and particularly. Um, as a way of sort of evolving his own Aikido understanding. Um, I think a lot of people like today, you might say, oh, um, you know, you go and take Iaido or something like the sort of like uh, standard um, institutionalized Iaido practice. But that 
um, you know, even Ishio Sensei said that kind of institutionalized Iaido practice won't necessarily help you understand Aikido better. So he was studying these kind of like more feudal arts in in EI, not the sort of, like even when you practice the Aido and you sit down with the sword, he says that's not something that you would traditionally do. You know, when you visited someone's home or you went to a castle and you're wearing your sword, you have to take it off and check it in. So these mm-hmm. these um, this way of kneeling and then drawing the sword is is just kind of a later invention. It, actually, those arts were sort of um, I say this like a kind of a personal refinement practice. They were actually based on like tea ceremony style. And so it was that kind of practice. But he was actually studying, you know, the kind of older forms. I see. I see. And so having had uh, Nishio Sensei as a, as a very significant influence for you, as well as other, other Aikido instructors and, and um, the other areas of your, your own personal martial arts background, I wanted to talk a little bit about your thoughts on the, the spirit of Aikido and how, how does Aikido differ from, say, like just a pure, a pure fighting system? And, and what are kind of the, the guiding principles that, that Aikido practitioners should be using to conduct themselves? And um, how, should, how should Aikido be something that contributes to somebody's uh, overall well-being, their life trajectory, and, and even their, their communities? Yeah, this is a this is a really important question, and it was an important question to to Nisho Sensei as well, um, because you know, like today, obviously we have MMA, we have all these people saying that you know Aikido is sort of becoming less relevant, um, and I think it's important to understand what Aikido is versus what it's not. I think you look at, uh, there's uh, some conversations that you can look at from uh, Roy Harris, that's, uh, you know, Roy Dean's teacher, and he talks about the different uh, kinds of martial art. You know, he talks about the traditional martial art, the eclectic, the holistic, the sportive, and the combative. And you can look up, you know, those kind of uh, podcasts and conversations that, uh, that Roy Harris has had on those. But When you look at a traditional martial art like Aikido, um, it's really about the development of of the person. Um, So in Aikido, even more than that, I think it goes beyond that. Aikido is really an expression of humanistic virtue. So right from the beginning, the priority in Aikido is, is completely different from a sport or a combat art. Um, you know, like you listen to like this, this, a lot of people have become very, uh, um, uh, interested in stoic philosophy lately. It's kind of, uh, a common, uh, topic among the kind of machismo crowd now. And the, the stoic philosophy though, in the sense of like Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus, it's really about valuing virtue that sort of virtue is its own reward rather than just focusing on winning um, and also in terms of being true to one's own nature, regardless of the outcome. So I think in this respect, there are a lot of areas that Aikido represents a real true expression of, of stoic practice. Hmm. Um, you know, I think uh, both O-sensei and Nishio-sensei were both really emphatic that Aikido is a Budo and that Aikido should express you know, we can put in kind of parentheses, Budo-ness. Uh, and part of this is studying about how you, what you're doing functions within the context of other martial arts. Um, for example, in Nisho's way of practice, every technique that we do has a striking element. There's a series of atemi. So we can take any technique and show a basic skeletal structure, which is entirely built upon a series of strikes. Or if we're Say we're using a sword, there's a series of cuts, and there's a series of strikes with a joe, if you're using a joe. And then every technique contains a throwing component, like judo. So in every technique, we should be able to look at a, a teiwaza, a koshiwaza, an ashiwaza. Every technique controls, you know, has a controlling element. So there's osaiwaza built into everything. So in that way, you can look at Aikido in terms of any martial art that you want to. So on the surface of it, you might say, well, Aikido kind of looks like 
many other martial arts, we find similar techniques. You know, a technique like kodagaishi or nikkyo is not unique to Aikido. Um, and so if you're studying the underlying principles of other martial arts, you should actually be able to find those same principles in your Aikido. So what I mean to say is like, in other words, in Aikido, you don't have permission to break the rules of good sound martial art practice. Right. I think that's important. But however, having said all of that, <laughs> what you're doing in Aikido is basically reframing that interaction. Um, you're, you know, Nishio Sensei even once wrote about, you know, when he was writing about uh, Aikido in a particular article, he said, you're, you're bending swords into plowshares, which of course is a quote from the Bible from Isaiah, you know, of taking something like a sword that was really traditionally meant for one purpose, and that's to cut down an opponent, to kill. Taking that and transforming it into something that has an opposite purpose to it. So like, for example, if you look at a temi and striking in karate, you, you know, you hit the opponent hard. The idea of winning is to disable, you know, the opponent with a strike. Um, but in Aikido, our use of the strikes should actually be different. Um, in Aikido, you don't use a strike to injure the opponent. The atemi is just to stop the opponent's kind of initiative, you know, their will to attack and to control the person without sort of endangering them. So if you're coming from a karate perspective or striking art perspective to Aikido, you might think of striking now in these terms. So rather than just you know, hitting people to break them or hurt them, you can use strikes as a way to mitigate the situation and, you know, Nishio Sensei's terms, sort of build a place of mutual coexistence. So it goes both ways. Nishio Sensei felt that in Aikido, we should learn from other martial arts, but it's also the role of Aikido to teach other martial arts what he talked about as a true Budo life, you know, to show people a deeper way to study things that they, they were already studying pretty much. Mm -hmm. And he, he would often talk about Aikido as, as being a Budo of forgiveness. Right. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting uh, term in the Japanese. It's Yurusu. And he called Aikido, his sort of uh, nickname for Aikido, I guess you call it, was a Yurusu Budo. And that word has a few different meanings. It can mean, you know, to accept someone, but it can also mean to forgive or to pardon somebody. Like, you know, if the police officer pulls you over and he says, all right, you know, just don't drive so fast, you know, go on. <laughs> and you're like, oh, whew, got out of that, you know. So you sort of, you pardon somebody. Um, and it can even mean to tolerate someone, you know, like if somebody's annoying you, you don't necessarily have to do anything about it. Sometimes you can just tolerate the person. And uh, so it's not always about, you know, uh, showing the person up. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, if you go back to this, um, the uh, stoic idea, like Marcus Aurelius would say, teach people, but if you can't teach them, then tolerate them. So this is very much at the heart of this whole concept of Budo of forgiveness. So there's this kind of acceptance and leading and tolerating. It's a beautiful concept. And um, I, I, that's actually what uh, Nisho Sensei titled his book that he did with, uh, that was published by Aikido Journal years ago that uh, Stan Prannan put together, I think. Right. Um, Exactly. Yeah, it was entitled the uh, Yurusu Budo, and then it was the Iribi Soku principle, you know, the one step entry principle, which I think we can get into later in some more detail and how that how that relates to this. So, yeah, you, know, you look at this concept of Yurusu and, and Nisho Sensei would say, well, the first thing is that you have to acknowledge the other person as a human being. Um, and, you know, traditionally, martial art did not, you know, at the, at the point that the person became your enemy, um, they were sort of not a person anymore. They were just something to cut down. Um, you know, in traditional martial art, if you cut with a sword, you need to cut with it 
But Nichio Sensei said, no, you don't cut the person with the sword. Actually, the little saying that he had sometimes was the true place for the sword is in the saya. Mm-hmm. Whereas as you do your technique, you should be able to return your sword to the saya without putting any blood on it. Mm-hmm. Actually, one time he joked a little bit, we're doing like a Nikyo and then he's taking you down. He says, you know, when you put the blade on the back of the person, he says, just a little blood, but only as much as you could clean up like with a tissue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you don't you know don't hurt them badly but a little bit's all right that way i i think we need to understand that too that this this training is is not completely uh you know with without effect in other words you definitely will feel things you know in you know from nicho sensei um but uh but it wasn't with malice mm-hmm mm-hmm it wasn't about maximizing damage to the opponent. No, it's the opposite of <laughs> the that. Opposite, you know, right. he he would say like, you know, in the past, the Buddha was sort of based on a concept of taking, and you know, ultimately that led to taking somebody's life. Um, it didn't it didn't allow you to to acknowledge or forgive the other person. Um, it was just you just cut them down. You know, so once they were the enemy, then any action that you took against that person was justifiable. And you actually see that in Japanese history and not only Japanese history, all history. You see that in American history. You know, once we decided that certain people weren't really people, then we could do whatever we wanted to them. Hmm. And the results were, were you know, horrifying. The, the, you know, the, the treatment of Native American peoples, the treatment of, uh, base, of other minorities, uh, treatment of slaves, all of these things. We have our own sordid history. And so Nicho Sensei pointed to the history of the samurai and found it rather reprehensible. He did not see people like Miyamoto Musashi as being a great hero. He saw them as kind of being the worst kind of human being. Hmm. And that it was our job in Aikido not just to figure out a new self-defense method. I think this is underrating Aikido in a huge way when we try to just go, well, how can we do better? If you need a self-defense class, great. Go take a self-defense class. Go to the Krav Maga school or whoever you feel is a good self-defense teacher. It's not really the purpose of Aikido just to, to do that thing. It's a much broader philosophical um, purpose that Aikido fulfills within the martial art world. And some people get it and some people don't, you know, some people just think, well, you know, if you can't take them down and punch them out, then what good is this thing? You know, martial arts should be able to hurt people. End of story. And that's not true at all. And even uh, uh, Roy Harris points this out. He says there are many other purposes for a martial art besides being a sport or besides being a combat form. Yes, yes, I think that's right. So, you know, you talk about some people not not really getting it. Um, how would you how would you kind of distill down what you think Aikido's place or role is in the larger martial arts world? Like, where should we, you know, where should we sit in that ecosystem, and how can we communicate that to to others? Yeah, I think this is a uh... This is a difficult thing because you have um, a sort of, um, you know, zeitgeist in the martial art world right now. Uh, Whereas if you say you do a martial art, people think of a certain thing. When I first got into martial arts, it was in the 70s. You know, you would watch Kung Fu on TV. You would watch Bruce Lee movies. And there was always... Um, the sense that this was a, a way of life, a philosophical endeavor. Even I have some old Bruce Lee books, you know, and they're, one of them's titled like Kung Fu, the Philosophical Martial Art. That was always a part of it. You know, when we would watch Kung Fu on TV, you know, with David Carradine, that was it was the philosophy of what was happening there. It wasn't just the fact that it was super cool that he could beat up all these guys at one time. Um, So I think there has to be a sort of maturity that happens in a person. Nisho Sensei felt like young kids probably couldn't really understand Aikido. They could do it from a gymnastic standpoint. And even at one point, he would he he was talking to um, Tomiki Sensei, and you know, and, and ultimately Tomiki developed uh, 
you know, there's Tomiki Aikido, which is kind of a competitive thing. And, and Nisho Sensei sort of agreed with them a little bit that maybe this would be a good thing, particularly for younger kids, so they could compete, you know, and have a, have a sense of like, uh, you know, accomplishment through that. Um, but he found it difficult uh, to explain this to a young, to a young child. So I think for us to get to a place where people appreciate Aikido, you have to first engage them at the level of, um, of its principles and of its spirit and its philosophy. And everybody that I've had that has been a good long-term student that stayed with it has come for those kind of reasons. The people that come and they're just looking for a better way to bend somebody's wrist don't tend to be good students. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think we need to talk about um, principles. We need to talk about philosophy. We need to get people to understand the spirit of what the art is so that they can kind of have an idea of why they're doing what they're doing. I mean, when you introduce a practice like Katate Dori, already we're in a really different world because no serious martial art person would just let their wrist be taken like that way or would even bother really grabbing the wrist in that way. So what are we talking about here? You know, we can talk about Katate Dori later if you want. Um, but I think in this respect, we've got to we've got to get to the point where we're talking about Aikido as principle and Aikido as as philosophy and Aikido as a a way of life uh, for people. And it may be that we're not going to get you know the people that just want to be a thug. But I don't think those are the people you want anyway. The, you know the the whole uh, difficulty is is that uh, people that become interested in martial art today very often just want to learn to hurt people. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of times they'll they may come in either with uh, the goal of wanting to learn to uh, to dominate in physical combat or to to be able to defend themselves. But you know, a lot of times through through training they'll they'll start to develop maybe uh, or start to seek deeper, deeper levels out of their, out of their practice. Um, and I think that that's an area where Aikido shines. Yeah, I've had a few occasions and one very recently where I've had people visit the dojo and they sort of want to challenge me. And, um, uh, you know, one was a judo guy a while back and then more recently another fellow was from some other martial art and they want to, they want to challenge you. I guess they want to know that it works and I get that, you know, you want to know that you're not wasting your time with something. Sure. Um, and so, but I, and then, you know, I sort of have to handle them and then I, I don't feel good about it afterwards because I don't think that's really what the purpose of Aikido training is about. Mm -hmm. But I also know that's the only thing that they'll really understand. Um, and in fact, I've got another student that's been with me for quite a long time. He was actually a karate student of um, uh, Demora, Fumio Demora. Do you, are you familiar with Demora? He's one of the early karate people in the U.S. Indeed, yes. Yeah, he was actually the, uh, like the, uh, he worked on the Karate Kid uh, first, the first movie there and did a lot of the scenes in there. And then his students, actually my student was in that movie as well. He's one of the, the Cobra Kai uh, guys. But anyway, when he first came, he was a you know, Karate guy and he'd done full contact competitions, you know, break your nose kind of stuff. And uh, he was a little skeptical about it. He's a big guy too, bigger than me. And uh, so I said, well, fine, you know, come at me. And so he came at me and I sat him down. And then he was like, wow, that was interesting. I haven't had that thing happen before. And now he's like, wow, I wish I would have discovered this a long time ago. Um, so I think, you know, sometimes I guess you do have to take that tack with people. Um, but I, I don't always feel good about doing it um, <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about... Um the the future of of aikido and one of the things that nisho sensei uh, i i really admire about him is that um, he was very flexible in terms of how um, what aikido is and how it you know how it can evolve in the future and how it's 
you know, it's totally fine um, to, you know, to pull things in from from other martial arts or incorporate new ideas and such. But at the same time, while he was open about that stuff, I, I think he also um, he had some pretty clear ideas about, OK, these are sort of the guardrails. Right. And the, these are the things that, that don't really change in terms of core principles or fundamentals. And then beyond that, um, you know, there can be a lot of, of creativity in terms of how Aikido is expressed or, or developed. And uh, yeah, I was just hoping to chat about that and get your perspective a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was very clear about that. He, he said once in an interview that uh, we should find our own kind of Aikido, that we should be really independent and try to create our own Aikido that's based on what our own kind of roots and traditions are and don't just copy, you know, Japanese things. Um, and that we should develop our own, you know, kind of our own individual nature. And so I think there's a lot of latitude in the future of Aikido as to what it is that, that we do and what directions that we take. It doesn't always necessarily have to look the same way like it did in the past. Um, but there definitely are um, things that make Aikido Aikido. And some of those are things that we've already talked about. For example, um, y you really have to decide whether or not you're sort of serving power or serving virtue in this sense. And what I mean is if you're just studying power, then clearly going to an MMA dojo and just learning how to um, win in that particular setting is the right answer for that particular question. If for you're sure. asking the question of how do I beat other people? Well, you should train on a few techniques that you're really good at. You should develop a ground game, you know, a standing game, a striking game, you know, et cetera. And you should be physically conditioned to be able to take a lot of punishment. And so if you're serving power in that sense, that's the right answer. As he's listening to Boss Rutan talk about, you know, he says, you know, he looks back on his fighting career and he says, you know, I, I realize now that I was just like seeking the uh, seeking the approval of my peers. Hmm. <laughs> he's honest about it. Now. <laughs> yeah. But in a stoic sense, how can you call that a, a virtue? You know, in this in that sense, it's you know, it shouldn't be about fame or money or power or success or recognition, you know, you virtue is its own reward. So if you're acting for the good of others and you're acting for the good of society and you're putting those needs before your own personal gain, you know, then that's an expression of Aikido's ideals. It's Aikido is really an expression of how an ideal society should be embodied within the context of a martial art. And it doesn't really matter sometimes whether you say, well, whether you win or whether you lose. I mean, I'll give you an example. If you take uh, people, and I'm not pointing these examples because they were perfect human beings, but just because they, they go to my point, if you look at somebody like Martin Luther King Jr. and his particular stand on on violence and, and how he went about um, uh, promoting the cause – uh, that he had for uh, for racial equality in this country. Um, how would his um, how would his cause had have been served had he said, well, we need to defend ourselves and you know carry guns and shoot back when they shoot at us? You know, I mean, in a way, you could say if he would have advocated some sort of violent response, which some people might say would be justified, how far back would he have set the cause of racial discrimination in this country? Mm -hmm. And so what was a practical answer for him personally in terms of his own safety and survival was not a practical answer in terms of his cause. And Nishio Sensei even talks about this. He says, you know, when, when you look at the history of the Western night, and uh, that, that history is about, in a lot of cases, fighting for individual honor. And this is really kind of what underpins the notion of Western sports. 
But he says the traditional Japanese way is never that a person fights for themselves. You wouldn't, you know, what kind of a samurai would you go to their house and you look around and you see a bunch of trophies on their wall? (laughs) (laughs) Who is that? I mean, what a deplorable example of a true samurai, right? Yeah. So in, in actuality, they were fighting for their country or fighting for their community or for their family. And so Nishio Sensei would say, when we can get together and decide as a community what the right way to be is, this is civilization and that way we can end violence. But if people fight by themselves, you're never going to have any end to this. It's just ongoing perpetual violence. So Aikido is effectively a kind of community consciousness of martial art rather than for the individual to be a a competitor. And as soon as you have in your mind about competing with the other person or going into the ring and and showing, even if you manage to wrangle a kodagaishi on somebody in the ring, Please don't call that Aikido. Just because you bend their wrist backward and they fall down, Aikido did not suddenly happen. Aikido is a much deeper view of the world than any individual interaction. Yeah, I think that's that's a, it's a pretty compelling perspective. So can we just geek out technically for, for a couple minutes on, on Nishio Aikido? Because we've talked a little bit about the... Uh, kind of the guiding philosophical principles and um I would love to because I'm a huge nerd on these oh. shows like you know <laughs> okay good 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 um and in an, kind of an audio format we're obviously limited in terms of of you know what we can you know what we can describe or or uh, or illustrate but um a couple things that I I found interesting are that um Usually in Nishio Aikido, you start from a, a natural stance, not not a hamni, right? Right. So can you talk about that for, for a couple minutes? Right, yeah. Um, the idea of, of, you know, kamai or taking a stance, right, uh, is right on the face of it, a sort of oppositional position. You know, let's say if you, if you've, if you could angle on the person or you put your hands up, You've already become part of the fight. You've already defined a situation that is based upon a conflict, and you're already expressing that you're not willing to accept the other person. So right from the very beginning, when you face a person, you have to face them in a way that you're sort of open to what it is that they have to say. Now, you're not going to be open to their attack or their strike, but you have to acknowledge the other person right from the beginning. It's really kind of uh, interesting. Sometimes I think about it, you know, like from a perspective of like, why do people get in fights? I was talking to a guy a while back who was a karate instructor, and he he was actually from uh, England, a kind of rough part there, and he always getting a lot of fights as a young guy, and and uh, he came home one day and his mom said, oh, you've been in another fight at the pub again. He goes, yeah. And she goes, why are you getting these fights? And he'd say, uh, he was looking at me. And then he says one day he came home and just told his mom that. And his mom said, well, you must have been looking too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so when you, you know, when you face off with another person, you know, you're you're creating part of that interaction. You know, when you look at why why people get attacked, you know, most of the time, if you're honest, you get attacked because you're being a jerk. <laughs> I mean, if you're a decent human being, and I'm not saying that this is going to protect you from every mugging. My sister, by the way, I'm over six foot tall. I'm a pretty big, you know, over 200 pound guy. I'm, but my sister, on the other hand, is five foot four and, you know, maybe a hundred pounds. And a few years ago, she came to visit me and she flew into LA. She rented a car and she stopped at a little market on the way back to buy some water. And she had uh, a $5 bill in her hand and her car keys. And that's it. She's standing in line and she felt something press into her in the back of her ribs. 
and she looked down and it was a pistol sticking in her side. Oh, wow. And, yeah, exactly. So, uh, and so, uh, I said, give me your money. So she hands him the $5 and he leaves. Well, thank goodness that she didn't know any martial arts. Right. <laughs> Right. You know, because nothing flashed through her mind that she was going to, you know, even if you do, okay, let's do some, let's, let's say, oh, I'm going to spin around. I'm going to take that hand spinning in a Kodagaishi. Yeah. And then the weapon discharges into some kid who's standing in the back of the line. Yeah. This is, you know, you have these fantasies about things. If somebody wants something from you, then give it to them. There's a, there's a story and it might be a good time to kind of, do you remember this story? Have you read that Nisho talked about Tohei's jacket? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The lesson in that, okay, just a brief summary of that. Uh, Tohei comes into the dojo one night and uh, he's really complaining. Somebody stole this beautiful leather jacket that he had bought while he was in Hawaii. And this was a time when, like, say you couldn't even get, like, leather shoes in, in Japan. You know, it was very, very tough economic times. So Tohei had this fancy jacket he bought in Hawaii. Well, somebody had stolen it and he was very upset about this. Oh, sensei came into the dojo in a little while and said, what's wrong with Tohei? And, uh, somebody said, ah, oh, somebody stole his jacket. And Oh, sensei said, well, it's your fault that somebody stole your jacket. I'm like what? You know, so oh, sen or Nisho sensei says, well, I, f I followed Oh, sensei afterwards. And I want to ask him like, why did you say that? You know, what, what do you mean? And he says, well, when you have nice things and you show them off and flaunt them to other people, you're tempting people and you're making that person into a criminal. So you have to take responsibility as a martial artist to not do that to people. So when you put people in a position where they, you know, where they want to hit you or want to fight you or kill you or anything like that way, you need to take some responsibility for that and say, well, you know, I put myself here. So if I'm carrying something around and somebody else wants it, well, maybe they need it more than I do at that point. So there you go. And I hope that that helps you. So that's the way to look at those situations. But, you know, you don't have to take the person and teach them a lesson you know, right there. That's, that's not the role of Aikido to do that. So I think when you talk about standing and she's entai, you're just acknowledging the other person when you do that. You know why like people, you know why doctors get sued? They don't get sued because they make a mistake. Again, they get sued because they were jerks because they disrespect people. And you'll solve a lot of your problems just by showing basic respect to other people. Mm -hmm. And sort of that that natural stance as a as a way to um, face or or greet a, a opponent or adversary or training partner or whatever is kind of a physical manifestation of that. I guess that's that's the idea. Yes, exactly. And there is yeah. um, there is of course you know kamai or hamni posture that's used if you're if you're actually if you get to the point where you're executing a throw or something like that you need a stable base. It's it's there. But the but the initiating position is just one of a natural stance, right? Exactly. And, and from a practical standpoint, it means you're always ready. You know, you don't have to assume some sort of special position or state of mind. If you train in a natural way that you're just standing there and res and just meet the person and meet their attack, then you're training yourself so that you're always ready no matter where you're at because you're just standing there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, you're 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 ready inside your mind. The kamai, the 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 um, the posture happens inside your mind. But with your body, you just stand like you could either defend yourself at that point or you could just shake hands with them. It could go either way. Very interesting. And another Another Nishio Aikido concept that I, I find fascinating is the idea of uh, irimi, right? Because it's it's a little bit different than kind of the standard um, the standard approach, or at least the standard way of thinking about irimi. Yeah, with with uh, irimi, I never um, and I trained, you know, with a lot of different shihan, and I never had anyone explain to me. Um, or teach in any sense the idimi the way that Nishio Sensei taught it. And when I learned it from him, it changed everything. 
that just that one understanding, um, I think can really revolutionize the way that you move, you know, traditionally, I don't say traditionally, but just prior to, you know, studying with Nisho sensei, um, irimi just meant going in, right? It's a verb, it's idu, right? To, to, to enter. And so you just basically go at the, you know, at the person or in some schools, it means going to the front, you know, as opposed to like irimi is to the front and then tenkan's to the back, right? Sure. Some traditions, but, but the whole idea is, you know, you're going at the person and, Nietzsche says, says, you don't go at the person, you move sideways. So if you imagine like you're standing in the street and a car is coming at you, you know, you have several choices. Um, okay, I need to get out of the way of the car. So I should run. Should I run toward the car? Okay, nah, so I got to work well. Maybe I could run away from the car or I could run at some other angle, you know, to toward the side of the street. Or I could go, what's the quickest way to get out of the street? You know, go straight sideways. Mm-hmm. And so essentially this movement is a movement in which you move directly to the side and you're creating about a 30 degree angle toward the opponent's center. And it's important to have your toes slightly turned in and it's difficult to kind of describe why all this works the way it does and the geometry of it. Um, but it comes out of sword as well. You know, with, with sword, you can't really afford to get cut like even a little bit. Yeah. And so, <laughs> right. And, and there's no, there's no such thing as being like a tough sword guy. You know? <laughs> so when people talk about toughness in martial arts, it's like, okay, how tough are you against this blade? You know, so the whole notion of toughness kind of goes out the window when you start thinking about things like this, you know, you, so you're moving to this position where if you had a sword that the opponent would not be able to easily strike you and that you're able to cut them if, if you wanted to. And the same thing with empty hand. You're able to strike the opponent from there, but they're not able to strike back. Um, it's kind of crazy and it's very – it's kind of shocking and a little disorienting to people when you first show them that because they'll strike you and then you'll move and you'll say, go ahead and hit me and they can't hit you from where you're at. Yeah. And the whole thing is that you're going to actually maintain that relationship without with the other person throughout an entire technique. And this is where people watch Aikido and they go like, wait a second, he could hit him there and there and there. But as you're doing a technique, you should constantly maintain a position where you could strike the other person, but they cannot hit you. Right. And that's hard to do. It's hard to do. But the and the geometry is very subtle. Um, but um most people move too much. I'll give you that clue. Most mm -hmm. people are moving, they're stepping too much. Um, the concept behind Irimi is actually a half step. And uh, Nisho Sensei said he got this from O Sensei, who, uh, who told him that uh, they, were, they were looking at a particular um, uh, uh, fight that had happened. And, and they said, see, this, the reason that guy lost is because he moved a whole step. And then Osensei explained to Nisho Sensei, he said, when you move a whole step, you create a disconnection between you and the other person. The way you stay connected, and I don't mean like, you know, the way connection doesn't mean like physically like wrapped up with them, but the way you maintain sort of connected control in the situation is by each, each step is only a half a step. All the footwork is divided into a half a step and you only advance by half steps. It's fascinating. It's fascinating stuff. And I, you know, I can sort of start to get a, a basic idea of the, you know, the, the framework of this, if I, um, if I start looking at some of the, you know, the illustrations either in the Nishio Sensei books or the videos or things like that, but I, you know, I can imagine it's, um, it takes a lot, of, a lot of work, a lot of practice to really embed that into your, into your movement system, but it's, um, it does. Yeah. It, it's based upon to the Edimi step is based upon your body, not the opponent's body. It, meaning that if it's a big person or a small person, your movement is, is, pretty much the same. So you don't, if, in fact, when I say most people step too much, if you step too far, you actually are in a place where you can get hit. Interesting. So it's, it's based upon your particular body size, how, how you move. And so all of the movement is really happening around yourself. 
Um, and it, this is a really important concept too. Something you really get into with handling the sword, and maybe we'll touch a little bit more on on sword work as well as as we go forward. But when you're handling a sword, you really get the sense that all of these arcs of movement are happening around my own physical centers, and I'm not pushing at the opponent. I'm not you know trying to press them. That's a basic principle of Nisho Sensei's Aikido is that you don't push people. You actually always draw the person out and you allow their strike or their attack to complete itself. You don't block. So anytime you see like whatever is, you know, Aiki sword practice being done and there's a lot of like banging of swords going on, Nisho Sensei really took some exception to that kind of practice. He says you shouldn't collide with the other person. Yeah, that's that's. That's interesting. So let's let's talk a little bit about sword. And now is a great a great time if uh, if you wanted to yeah yeah develop that a little bit. Sure. Yeah. This the sword um, in Nishio Sensei's model of Aikido as a Budo is one of the three pillars. Um, the first one is uh, what we've already talked about, which is the concept of Idimi. The second one is a temi, the ability to strike. And um, let me just add there that a temi doesn't actually result in hitting a person. Um, our temi actually is a way of defining space and, and sort of the rhythm of the technique. Um, but we ultimately don't actually use the temi to make a physical strike on the person. But let's go to the sword because I think that's um, that's, that's very interesting. Um, the third pillar is what Nisho Sensei called Misogi no Ken, which is, of course, the purifying sword, um, which is different from like a, a killing sword. And as I mentioned earlier, when we were talking, I said, you know, the true place for the sword is in the Saya. And so Nisho Sensei said that O Sensei taught that the sword in Aikido is not for cutting, but it's for purification. Um, so it's sort of a way of removing the impurity of, of both opponents. And it's, it's so important to understand the sword. And unfortunately, it's been sort of marginalized in a lot of Aikido practice. Nishio Sensei even went so far to say, he says, I don't think it's even possible to understand Aikido without some understanding of, of the swordsmanship. Uh, so, um, we have this, um, art within Nisho Sensei's tradition called Aiki Toho Ei. And this is what means, you know, an Aikido sword method, uh, of Eido. And the, the way that we study this now is um, based upon sort of three levels of using the sword. The basic level of using the sword is to use the sword to cut. So when you're first beginning at the sort of, say, first and second on levels of practice, you use the sword as in the way that any Eido person was, would, and you just use the sword and you do the forms and you cut all the way through. Um, the second level, and these have really been elucidated by my current teacher, uh, uh, Koji Yoshida Sensei. The second level is you, you use the sword, but you enter to the person's side and control them, sort of joining with them. The third level of the use of the sword, the upper level of use of the sword, you draw the sword and you move through the technique, but you never actually cut the opponent. You just create a, a common space. In effect, what you do is you cut the way toward the technique. You cut a path in front of the person where the technique goes, but you never actually use the sword against the other person. You know, Nisho Sensei thought it was like actually a crime to cut a person or to injure a person. Hmm, that's fascinating. And, and certainly when you watch his sword work, it's, it's very distinctive. It looks quite different than, you know, than most Aiki, Aiki sword work. Yeah, there's, um, I don't remember who wrote it. I think he's up in Canada, but there's a review of Nishio Sensei's uh, Aiki Toho videos that I found some years ago. And um, these are like, you know, real Iaido 
kind of professional people writing the review. And they go like, most of the time when we look at uh, Ike sword stuff, we go like, hmm, this person's uh, never used a sword before. But, uh, you know, Nisho Sensei was uh, really careful in teaching sword. You know, in the beginning, you learn how to handle the sword in a very proper way. Uh, so it's not just some sort of made up thing. You know, it really comes out of the true proper use of of the Japanese katana. So let's talk a little bit about um, you know, Aikido is a Japanese art and um, your instructors are, are Japanese. I, I have a, a Japanese instructor. We live in in the Western world. And so um, what do you think about those dynamics and kind of what's the what's the role of the instructor, do you think, in in Aikido? Maybe more kind of let's say in the in the Western, you know, Western world than if you're if you're in Japan. Like what do you think is that student teacher paradigm that that works works best? And uh have you experienced any, you know, any of the let's say kind of the dysfunctional dynamics that, you know, that you you know tend to occur um in like a hyper traditional, let's say Japanese model when you transplant that into a Western society? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I've probably, you know, I mean, I've been in Aikido for a long time. So I've probably been the dysfunctional dynamic at some points along the way. I'm sure we all we all have. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I can sort of look back on myself with a little, you know, embarrassment at times and go like, wow, why were you? Why would you be in that way, you know? And so, you know, and you kind of mature a little bit and hopefully, hopefully you grow up uh, a little along the way and, and uh, shed some of that, you know, you're trying to kind of play some, some caricature of a, of a person, you know, instead of just being yourself with my own students, I am just another person. You know, it's interesting at the last time, uh, Nishio Sensei came to the United States. It was in 2000, and Stan Pranam was there at that seminar, mm. and I and I had a chance to just sit and and talk one on one with Stan for a little while, and I said, yeah, I mean, it was really amazing that you had the opportunity to talk to all of those teachers in Japan and all these, and he just said one thing. He says they're just guys. <laughs> right, right. That was from Stan. They're just guys. That was that was. I'm quoting him exactly. Just guys. So just be a person. You know, be just like we talked about Shizentai. When you stand in front of a person, just stand there as an honest person. You know, as Marcus Aurelius would say, be true to your own nature. If it is what you are, then be that thing. And there's going to be different teachers with different personalities. And that's fine. But just be true to who you are. Don't think that you need to put on something. If people will respect you, they will respect you for the right reasons. Um, But you don't want to get yourself into the trap of playing some kind of a role, you know, so that you sort of enslave yourself to it. That's, That's no way to live. So you're just there, you know, with my students, I train alongside them. We train together. I'm just, they're like a family. And so in a way you can look at the basic principles that we've talked about of Aikido about, you know, like being natural and accepting people and forgiving people and just take all those things, all those things and apply those to your role as a teacher and, and be that kind of person. Um, because if you're not authentic people will smell that you know this is like who is this guy think he is you know what do you think he can do it so you know if i make a mistake in class or if i show something wrong and then i have to fix it you know it happens oh yeah i made a mistake let's do it this way and i go okay that's fine nobody loses any respect for you over that you know you're just a person Right. So, um, you know, I think a lot of the early teachers that came from Japan, um, I mean, I don't want to disparage anybody, but they probably really felt that they had to play that role. Um, you know, they were in a foreign country. They needed to kind of, you know, have people show a little respect for them. And maybe they felt like the Americans were a little too casual 
Um, so they need to enforce a little bit of that. So I'm sure a lot of those power dynamics went on. I don't have that kind of relationship with Yoshida Sensei now as my teacher. Um, we just have a regular, we're two men. I'm a grown man. I have my own life. He's a grown man. You know, there's no reason to treat people any differently. They're there to learn and we're all there to grow together. And we're, we're, we're focused on the art and not on the teacher, you know, as some sort of like personality cult, mm -hmm. you know, and our, our, um, uh, affection for Anisho Sensei was certainly because he was just a great gentleman and a, a, a really great human being. Uh, but we're not involved with some sort of personality cult where, you know, he's some, so, somehow deified. Yes. Nothing like that at all, you know, and, and be honest about your limitations. You know, yes. if you, it's things that you can do, there's things you can't do. You don't have to be everything to everybody. And especially like, don't get into like, you know, being some kind of spiritual guru to people, you know, ugh. that's not even the role of Aikido is to, you know, do that for people. Aikido is really more, I think, at least, and this is how I get it from Nishio Sensei. And it might be different things for other people. You know, I think O Sensei lived in a very different time. O Sensei was like 40 years older than Nishio Sensei. So it was like a whole different generation. For sure. Um, but I think Nishio Sensei is a kind of modern person. He was a very, you know, he used the word like a cosmopolitan, you know. Cosmopolitan actually comes from that Greek, you know, the, 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 uh, your polis, you know, your, the town you live in is the cosmos. Hmm. The world is your cosmos. That is, that is your, you know, so it, it's about really creating a good society and the dojo has to be a good kind of society for people as an example of that. We're brothers and sisters Younger people come to train with me. I look at them. I look at them like they're my son or my daughter, you know, not in an actual sense, but you know, you sort of treat them in that way, in in the kind of caring and nurturing way for people. And when uh, you know that that old saying, you know, people they don't care how much is it, you, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Hmm. So if you're there for their good, you know, if we stand in front of a person and we're there trying to help them. That person's not going to attack you. <laughs> hey, how can I help you? Oh, do you need that parking spot? Great. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Right. Uh, they're not going to attack you. So when when your students, you know, respect you, it's because you care about them. So show them love and concern in the same way that Aikido is teaching us to show love and concern for people, even when they're attacking us. You know, forgive them even when they do something wrong to you, because the bigger win is not that you, you know, get a technique on them. The bigger win is that you uh, resolve the situation and make society in general better because of the way that you handle the situation. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing uh, with us today. And we really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk with the Aikido Journal community. Thank you. It's been really amazing, Josh. Thanks for having me on. And it was a pleasure to share with everybody. Thank you for listening to the Aikido Journal podcast. If you find our work valuable, there are many ways you can support it. You can share it on social media, join the discussion on our blog, or you can support us directly by subscribing to Aikido Journal TV, a membership that gives you on-demand access to our video library, new digital gift boxes each month, and other perks. Then, there's the Aikido Journal Academy, which produces special events and online courses. All these things and more you'll find on our website at aikidojournal.com. And again, thank you for your support. It's an honor to serve the Aikido community.